Howdy. That's the intro? Because that was weird. Yeah, just trying a new look, verbally. That's the thing, right? I don't know, bud. You can't just do that. You know, just go and reinvent the wheel. Hey, don't worry about it, okay? I got this one. Hey, folks, welcome back. This is Elliot with the Poor Pros Almanac, here with Andy. Yeah, you gotta be, gotta be cool like that. Cool. What are we uh, talking about today, bud? Egyptian nocturnal farming? Uh, Filipino nip twist karate? No. Pavlovian rock tossing? Why? Why are you so bad at this? I didn't read any of it. What are we talking about today? Let's start over again. Do the rewind thing. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Poor Pearls Almanac. Hope you're excited to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago or something like that. Uh, we're recording in the past, so like we have no context for time or when we did the last content. Yeah, time isn't real. It's a, it's a construct. Time. Brought to you by Lowry's. I could ask what year it is, but it doesn't matter. Will those jokes ever get old? They're already so old that they're on Medicare. <laughs> For you non-Americans, that means they're so old the government has to actually provide health insurance. Eh, that's kind of gross, right? Yeah, with that in mind, let's talk about health insurance for our soils. Korean natural farming. Hey, that transition was pretty smooth, like butter. That I can't eat because my insurance will say I had a pre-existing health condition. Hunger. So, why do you hate freedom? What, the freedom to die? I mean, I didn't specify, but you know, go on. Nah, man, the government has to certify that too, as a traded security with your death certificate. Yeah, it's fair. So, in the last episode, we had talked about how to improve the minerals and the nutrition in the soil using things like shells and rocks and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, plants love dead things, and organic compounds broken down by bacteria, fungus, and other little invisible symbiotic pals. In this episode, we're going to spend some time focusing on living stuff, mostly. A lot of these processes involve using brown sugar, and I do want to talk about why it's important and also its shortfalls. Not only does this practice rely heavily on these sugars, but also on species native to Eastern Asia, which I guess shouldn't be a surprise considering it's called Korean natural farming, which are non-native to most folks listening to this. This doesn't really fit into our concept here of trying to build infrastructure that is, well, not necessarily a closed loop, but at least as closed as possible. So now that we know how to build the mineral content of the soil, let's talk about the most fundamental powerhouse of KNF. Lactobacillus acid, or LAB. LAB is probably one of the most understood bacteria that is incredibly, overwhelmingly positive in just about every application. Yeah, even with people, right? Because you tried to feed me some? Yeah, it's a great drink. It's a probiotic, and it's really great for your gut. Or your goat's gut. Scientifically speaking, they're defined as this really broad family of beneficial microbes that take the shape of like a long stick or a cane. They've been proven to do everything from increased pest resistance to increasing sheep maternal antioxidants to their offspring. Okay, so what is it exactly? Like, how does it matter or work or taste? So I don't really know how it tastes because I don't want to drink it. I'm waiting for Elliot to do that first. But let's explain a little bit about what they are. So they're these super tough bacteria, first off, and they can live with or without oxygen. They can persist at nearly boiling temperature, and they multiply faster at room temperature than almost any other microbe. These bacteria, usually found in decomposing plants and milk products, produce lactic acid as the major metabolic end product of carbohydrate fermentation, giving them the common name lactic acid bacteria. Lactic acid fermentation is a metabolic process by which glucose and other six carbon sugars, sorry for the big word, are converted into cellular energy and the metabolite lactate, which is lactic acid, in solution. It is an anaerobic fermentation reaction that occurs in some bacteria and animal cells, such as lactobacillus, and that's probably the most scientific thing I've ever said on this podcast. Yep. If oxygen is present in the cell, many organisms will bypass fermentation and undergo cellular respiration. However, facultative anaerobic organisms will both ferment and undergo respiration in the presence of oxygen. So what that means is it can exist with oxygen and without oxygen and be all right. Production of lactic acid has linked LAB with food fermentation. So you've probably heard the term lacto-fermented, 
This acidification inhibits the growth of spoilage agents. Furthermore, lactic acid and other metabolic products from this process contribute to the profile of a food item, making it taste more unique because it has been fermented in this process. All right, so I'm going to bring it back to food because that's all I really know about, but not a huge fan of fermented foods, but I do love pickles. And those are different processes, but they all are sort of related in some way. Yeah, you got to get them pickled baby onions, buddy. The difference between pickling and fermenting is really the process of how they develop their flavor. Pickled foods are sour because they're soaked in an acidic brine, while fermented foods are sour because of that chemical reaction that we're talking about. Now, LAB is also, outside of the KNF world, documented super heavily in the food industry as having been recognized as a GRAS, which is generally recognized as safe status. And this is due to their ubiquitous appearance in food and their contribution to the healthy microbiota of animals and humans. Their ability to withstand low pH environments helps LAB to outcompete other bacteria in a natural fermentation, as again, they can withstand that increased acidity from organic acid production. Great. So I didn't know any of that about bacteria. I appreciate that. Did you want to? I mean, I guess. That's why I'm here, right? Is it? Are you telling me I'm here against my will? Are you? Can, can I leave? Can you? I can? Maybe. So it's like a yes and no answer, is what you're saying. Yeah, like, like everything I do. That's classic, buddy. Bureaucrat. I work hard at being a bureaucrat. Somebody's got to do it, and it's a real lot of work to just meander and say lots of things without accomplishing anything. That's why we got this podcast. Yeah, like I can just ramble and people, for some reason, listen. The thing that's really interesting is that while Korean natural farming isn't really mainstream, it's been growing fairly significantly in popularity over the last 10 years or so in particular. And one of the things that happens when these types of new farming practices start to gain traction is that there's a lot of people that'll go out and their hope is to one-up other people and to either create new recipes or to try to explain why these things work without knowing how they work. And in that process, things tend to become more and more overblown. So yeah, when we're talking about this stuff, I try to frame it within an accessible way that it makes sense and can be proven through, you know, whether it's research or whatever it might be. So when we talk about this stuff, especially like bacteria, it's going to feel a little bit like a science class because that's our goal is to make it based in reality. Yeah. And also because he didn't have science class in high school, we established that already. Yeah. So I'm just trying to make it up now. And like, this is my high school biology class in chemistry. Oh, it's my teacher. Yeah. You didn't take those. No, I didn't. You took earth science and then you took recycling class. It's called environmental science because we cared about the environment, Elliot. You wouldn't know anything about that. You recycled Coke cans. Yeah, I did during my lunch class. It was great. See, he failed lunch. He didn't even do that right. You know, someone's got to do it. They said it couldn't be done, and then there I was. You were terrible at school. Stay in school, kids, or you could end up on a ridiculously niche podcast. Yeah, you don't want to do this. I'm just saying. It doesn't matter. School's indoctrination anyway. So I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. The point is that because of LAB's particular place within an ecosystem, it offers a lot of benefits from helping our guts to helping our livestock. I mentioned that they can survive in these anaerobic conditions. If we remember from the soil episode, that means that our soil is without oxygen and traditionally is considered to be breeding pathogens or is more susceptible to breeding pathogens. In aerobic conditions, they can breathe in oxygen, which is no big deal, but in anaerobic conditions, they can ferment and start bubbling, just like yeast might bubble inside of a baking bread, which creates pore spaces, which can then fill up with oxygen. So they can ventilate a soil that's about to go anaerobic and help a soil that already is. And while they do this, they also eliminate bad odors. So the foul odor that you might recognize in like a compost pile because it's gone anaerobic, it gives off like a really ammonia smell. And it's not just a smell, it's actually ammonia. The same ammonia smell that's in like a chicken coop or a pen is the same process. And lab has the same effect there that it does in the soil. This has been documented and actually applied on some pretty big scales, including the pigs during the, I think it was the 2008 Beijing Olympics, where there was a giant fear of like factory farming smells when uh, they had the event. So they actually sprayed LAB as well as some other things to manage the smell. Just a fun fact. 
And this same process can be used with like livestock or food waste that can be redirected to livestock by the use of like lacto fermentation. The great thing about lacto fermentation is not only can you store foods with it, but it's actually been documented to increase milk production, fat content, and protein content in dairy cows. Pig labs. It's where pigs learn to fly. The end is an eye. Yeah, hopefully. That's why we're here. So further, LAB has been repeatedly documented to protect leaves from absorbing pathogens by both lowering the pH on the surface of the leaves and using that lactic acid byproduct to protect the plant. The same thing it does to inhibit bacterial growth in a fermented food is also playing out on your leaf surface. Yeah, so I have so many questions. Like, do you get cramps drinking LAB? Like lactic acid builds up in your muscles and gives you cramps and stuff? Like, do I just mummify? This whole episode's going to be about LAB, isn't it? And all these questions definitely set you up for another classic yes or no answer, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. I'm doing so good at this. I get excited sometimes. And in a field that's never really cut and dry as good and bad, lab checks off a lot of those good boxes. So you want to use it. It's super easy. All you have to do is get yourself a cup of dry rice and put it in a cup of water, swish it around and strain out the rice and save the water. Once you take that, you let it sit out. It'll be this like nasty gray white color. And after you let it sit out and without any direct sun with like a loose cheesecloth or a napkin or something over it, after a couple days, you'll see a separation starting in the jar and a white film will show up on the top and there'll be some like stuff on the bottom as well. And then in the middle, it'll be much clearer, but there'll be some stuff floating around. And what that is, is that you've attracted the lactobacillus that exists all around us, and they've gone after those residual carbohydrates that are in the rice water. Now, the white stuff that's settled on the bottom, you don't want that. The same on the top. What you need to do is slowly drain the liquid out into a larger bottle or cup. And what you're going to do is a 10 to 1 ratio of the residual water that you pull out of it. So if you pull out two ounces of that middle water, uh, you're going to add 20 ounces of milk. So it's a, it's a pretty simple formula, especially if you have like a measuring cup. Typically, I'll use like a turkey baster and stick it in below that film on the top, suck out some of it. And like I said, you don't need a whole lot because of the fact that you're going to be adding 10 times that amount of milk. And uh, what you're going to do is then take that again, give it a week sitting out with a cover on it just to keep stuff from going in, but it needs to be breathable. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a curd buildup on the top. And what that is, is the stuff that the lactobacillus doesn't want. It's the proteins and the fats. Technically, it's cheese and people eat it. And you're going to remove that curd and the liquid that's left behind. That's your lab. And you're going to use that at around a 1 to 1,000 ratio as a spray or a soil drench to help your plants or to reduce the stench in your coops. And it will store for about six months. So is the cheese the, the lab? So the cheese is the cheese. It's the curd. The LAB is the liquid that's left behind. And what you'll do is put like about a teaspoon per gallon of water. So you'll take like a gallon of water, add a teaspoon to it, put it in like a sprayer. Or if you're just going to do a root drench and just like water it like a normal plant, then you need to give it a quick swirl and water your plants with it. And that's pretty much it. That's how you utilize it. So it's just a quick foliar spray. Yeah. And you get a cheese byproduct is what you're saying. Yeah. And some people eat the cheese and I'm pretty into weird cheeses, but I have not gone that far yet. I mean, I would rather eat a new cheese than drink like rice water because I do it for the poutine. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just throw it on top of some fries, some gravy. Oh, hell yeah. Now, now you're selling it to me. <laughs> Are you thirsty? No? Do you want to be? Try bean curd! With twice the chewiness of a sponge and half the flavor of dough! What could be better? Nothing! Take your high-protein block of cardboard and make a great meal incredibly mediocre. Say it with me now. Herd your thirst with curd! Can you smell what the rock is cooking? Because it's bean curd. Learn more about the power of bean curd at poorpoles.com. Stay thirsty, friends. Okay, so we ate up way too much time talking about lab. That's L-A-B. 
LAB. Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize to the LAB gods. We're like a third of the way through this episode, and we've only talked about one thing. And we really only scratched the surface of how this works, but needless to say, it's like the biological equivalent to like, did you try turning it on and or turning it off and turning it back on again? It just seems to like be a really good way to re-regulate a lot of the shit that's going on in whatever's going on, our plants or livestock or whatever it might be. Now let's flip over to what LAB is typically paired with. And when I say paired with, when we use things like LAB, the resources we are about to talk about, fermented plant and fruit juices, we'll often mix them in the same gallon of water. So when we're saying one teaspoon of LAB per gallon, well that gallon might also have a teaspoon of FFJ, FPJ, or OHN, or DSW, or... Isn't isn't DSW a shoe store? I'm confused. Yeah, that's where it gets confusing. The point is, we'll take each of these and add them to the same gallon of spray that we're going to spray our plants with, just like you might any other chemical for pest resistance as a recipe, essentially. And you'll know what you need where based on the state of the plant. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the extraction process, specifically what's chemically happening, because I think much like with the lab, if we don't understand what's happening, or rather why the things the people say are happening are happening, it's easy for it to seem, well, suspicious. Like someone in an 80s horror movie suspicious? Like a black dude in an 80s horror movie suspicious. (laughs) Sugar has like seven main roles in K&F. The last one we're not going to talk too much about. I'm just going to mention it and you can go Google it if you want. The first is to, and the most important really, is to apply osmotic pressure to break down cell walls, releasing those nutrients and hormones from inside the plant. And there's two processes here. There's plasmolysis, which is the drying out, and cytolysis, which is the explosion through penetration. Nice. Nothing for me. What? What? I was just staring at Elliot's face as I said that, and I expected... I can be mature about science. Can you? Do we have to do all this again? Yeah, I totally left that hanging there. It's low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this osmotic pressure isn't necessarily breaking down any cellular walls, but rather forcing those nutrients and hormones out through the semi-permeable membranes. Any cell wall breakage may come from the fermentation process, but not the osmotic pressure. Now, the second role that sugar has in KNF is really around to filter the microorganisms present to ones that can survive those high osmotic pressure. And what this does is it removes some of the pathogens because most pathogens can't survive those high osmotic pressures. The third one is to remove oxygen through the anaerobic fermentation process. And much like how yeast locks up oxygen by making alcohol. This prevents the oxidization of hormones, minerals, and vitamins, which allows these processes to become more shelf-stable. The fourth is that sugar also helps with the creation of alcohol, like we had just mentioned, and then live vinegar. Vinegar is a key function of the extracts in the previous episodes, and we had talked about how it can be a crucial tool in Korean natural farming. The fifth is to feed the biology through those sugars present in the FPJ, the FFJ, the FAA, and OHN. So we're trying to build up some of the microbiology while also then essentially locking them in place through the osmotic process. Number six is that it's also a potential source for minerals, vitamins, and antioxidants. While sugar might not be the first thing you think of when someone says vitamins and antioxidants, there is some really good bioavailable resources in unprocessed sugars, and obviously not at the scale we eat them. And then the last one, which again, we're not going to really talk about, is supersaturation, which is a storing process to make various products shelf-stable through the osmotic process, not the alcoholic process. And all that is is essentially packing way too much sugar into something so that it doesn't go bad, like a jam. So now that we understand the utility of the sugar, let's talk a bit about what sugar is. Now, sugar can be processed from like a lot of different ingredients. From the traditional cane sugar that we're familiar with, to corn and maple and beet and more. Dried sugar can be extracted in two ways. The first is the removal of water from the filter plant extract through natural evaporation. Now anyone knows that's tried to dry things out through natural evaporation, it takes a lot of energy to dry out in space. Especially that final stage where you're really drying the last morsels out of the whatever it is. This can require a ton of surface area, time, and energy. And reducing energy costs 
either means expensive vacuum distillation equipment or labor and space intensive natural drying. Having naturally dried salt from salt water, I can confirm that natural drying can be a huge time and labor sap. To do just like a cup or two of salt can take multiple weeks. Yeah, and you can see him do all of that on his YouTube channel. He's just over there a boiling some water. First off, our YouTube channel. And second off, it's exciting to watch that water boil. But the flip side to this process really is that through that natural process, much like when we make our homemade salt, is that it retains more of those vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. The best example that's most likely going to be on a shelf at like a grocery store is jaggery, which is essentially like a block of brown sugar. They're not super cheap, but they are pretty cool if you're not used to seeing them. Yeah, it's not cheap. Yeah, and the second process is far more cost effective, and that's where most of our sugar products come from, and that's the removal of sugar through heating and crystallization. This process has three main products, which is turbinado sugar, which is that sugar in the raw or rock sugar, which is 99% crystalline, and additionally, a first-run molasses and second-run blackstrap molasses, which generally has a higher mineral content. The turbinado is either further filtered through charred bones or bleaching or other stuff and then dried to make white sugar, which is 99.9% sucrose. When sugar is separated through crystallization, almost all of the minerals remain in the molasses. Brown sugar is made by adding molasses back to that crystalline sugar. The addition of water in the molasses softens the sugar in the minerals and it darkens the color and richens the flavor. For comparison, molasses is about 50% sucrose, jaggery is about 80% sucrose, and brown sugar is about 97% sucrose. Well, ain't that sweet. Bum, bum. So all these processes from making booze to LAB to pickles and vinegar is all related. And I learned this in school, but here I am talking about it here and now, and I don't hate it. So how does all this relate to k &F? So in k &F, it's preferred to use what's called a full spectrum evaporated sugar, such as jaggery over molasses because the plant material adds water and we want the final juice to be full or super saturated sugar solution, which means that you've essentially frozen the microbiology in place because there's no water to keep them active. So we don't want those lower sucrose and by definition, higher water content sugars, but we also want to have the mineral and all those other benefits of the natural processes versus just plain white sugar. So the ideal sugar source would provide those vitamins and minerals while still having very little moisture. The ideal amount of sugar moisture for fruit or a high moisture plant is really around 1.5% by weight. Now, brown sugar is 1.3% water and contains some minerals. So osmotic pressure really requires a very small amount of moisture to be felt. Normally this would come from the sugar from the surface of the plant material, cut stems and veins and whatever it might be, and from some cells being broken in the mixing process. So it's rare, but for some dry herbs and leaves, it can be beneficial to add like a few drops of a previously made fermented plant juice or molasses or even maybe just some of that turbonado sugar or something that can help slightly moisten some of the surface material to help jumpstart the osmotic extraction process. Ultimately, you want to make sure the total moisture content of your molasses and sugar combination doesn't go over that 3% figure, just about. So what all this means is that brown sugars have the lowest moisture content while also adding in those vitamins and minerals. Okay, so it would make sense to use brown sugar or even if you could dry out some of those cubes of jaggery would also work because of the mineral content as well as the right amount of water. Yeah, so the jaggery would be a little bit too moist unless you're doing something that's super dry. One of the things I see a lot in like K&F groups on Facebook is the idea of like, I want to make a, a fermented plant juice out of cannabis, but the leaves are super dry. So like if you try to make a traditional K&F just using leaves and brown sugar, it's not going to produce any liquid really. You might get a drop or two, but that's not like really worth all the effort. But if you use something like jaggery that's got a little bit more moisture in it, you'll probably draw a little bit more out of it because you're making up for the lack of liquid that's in the leaves. So you're trying to find that sweet spot between the water content of the plant itself that you're fermenting or processing and the sugar itself. Yeah, so get out your refractometers or whatever they're called. Yeah, you could definitely use one. I've never really actually thought about that, but I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. 
Are we in a test kitchen or a cooking lab cooking LAB or creating content? You know us. We're always cooking up that content. That's what we're doing. We're, we're cooking up content. Chefing it up. Chefing it up. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. This is Andy from the Poor Pearls Almanac. Hopefully, you're enjoying the podcast so far. And right now, I'm talking to you from a commercial in a Poor Pearls Almanac podcast. I'm sure you're enjoying the show and maybe even enjoying some of our ridiculous ads. We are able to keep our episodes ad-free and keep the lights on here because of support from listeners like you. If you think we're adding valuable perspective to the subjects of agriculture, ecology, climate change, and politics, then please consider giving us some support on Venmo, Ko-Fi, Patreon, or PayPal, all of which can be found at our website, poorproles.com. Please, don't make me go to Jeff for money. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Basil. Jeffrey, 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 Jeff, 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 Jeffrey, Jeffrey Basil. Uh. <laughs> All right, so let's get to those recipes, right? Now that we understand how the sugars work in the extraction process, we can talk a little bit about the fermented plant juice and the fermented fruit juice. The processes are exactly the same, so there's no point in repeating them twice and swapping in the word fruit for plant. The only difference is that we use plant material in one and fruit in another. FPJ, that is the plant juice, is primarily for plants in vegetative states, as in not fruiting yet, and FFJ is, you guessed it, primarily for plants in fruiting stages. Now, this process is really simple. and Wait, wait, wait. Good. I understood that part. Oh, man. Can we can we get that on the uh, repeat slow motion? I understood that part. I understood that part. I understood that part. I understood that part. I want to see Elliot's face just light up. The literally light bulb just went on above my head. Like I get it. <laughs> this is what I keep him around for: the moments of triumph. So the process is simple. Um, you want to harvest the plant or fruit that you're harvesting. Wow, I'm gonna use the word harvest more. So you harvest the plant or fruit that you're uh, planning on using early in the morning. And the reason for this has to do with that transpiration of the plant during the night. And we had talked, as Elliot knows, about bricks content two episodes ago and the importance of the process of the liquid within the plant playing a role in how much the plant weighs during the night when it's not photosynthesizing. It's still respirating, so it's releasing moisture. So in the morning when you harvest it's going to be a more dense nutritionally plant or fruit or whatever it might be. And by harvesting in the morning, we're getting more of that nutritional value per ounce or pound or whatever measurement you want to use. In this process, you've harvested these things. You don't want to wash them. You're just going to chop them up pretty small, a few inches at most. If it's really harder fruit, you want to chop it a little bit smaller. And what you'll do is weigh the fruit, and then you're going to add equal parts of that brown sugar. So if it's a pound of fruit, you're going to add a pound of brown sugar. You're going to mix that really well and until all the surface area is covered. Pack it in tightly into a glass jar with a breathable lid, like cheesecloth or paper towel, just like LAB. And what you're going to do is just put it in a dark place and give it a couple days, sometimes up to a week. It depends on how warm the temperature is and a little bit of luck. Yeah, and if you were paying attention, we already went over the science of why we're doing this. So feel free to go back and re-listen because my eyes may or may not have glazed over several times. It's only been like the third time, so it's catching up. Brought to you by science. We can do things if we understand things. Yay! It's pretty fun, right? We can speed up death's decay and decomposition and make it not smell as bad because we understand. This is great. I'm learning. He's learning, everyone. So yeah, during that time, the four to seven days, you're going to just kind of keep an eye on it and you're going to see the liquid start building up at the bottom. Uh, And that's the good stuff. That's what you want. You might even see a little bit of white mold on the top. And that's honestly fine. As long as you don't see a whole bunch of other colors. And even then, I'm kind of indifferent about it. But other people will say that is a problem. For the record, this one's not cheese. This one is definitely not cheese. This one is not cheese. Don't eat it. Okay, cool. <laughs> just just so just so we're clear. For liability's sake. Yeah. Don't eat that white one. So if you are really concerned about mold being on the top, because you don't want to waste your time doing all this for it to go bad, you can do like we had talked about in the fish amino acid 
conversation and just put a brown sugar cap, which literally means cover the entire top with like brown sugar packed in. And that way no bad stuff can get in. So at the end of this, when you start to see that it's like really starting to look nice and thick and it's been sitting for a few days, you're going to want to drain it off. And if we think about this whole process, you know, we focused on osmotic pressure to remove all these things and to leave stuff back in the plant. So when we drain it, we don't want to squeeze it all out. We want to let it come out naturally through that, again, osmotic process. So you might want to put it in like a funnel or something with keeping it from all the chunks going in and just let it drip out for like a couple hours. Okay. So I'm starting to wrap my head around the process, but do you get the same yield of the nutrients you're trying to target from just any random plant or do you have to match plant species or are there any other controls in this experiment? Like how does this work? Yeah. So you can use any old plant, but preferably you want to get the younger shoots of that plant. And what we're trying to harvest here are a couple things. We want to harvest the nutrition of the plants, which is plant soluble because of the fact that, well, it's already in a plant. And we can figure this out by taking a look at Dr. Duke's phytochemical and ethnobotanical databases, which is hosted by the USDA and has the chemical profile of thousands of plants and not only the plants, but their roots, their flowers and their fruits. So if you have something that's like incredibly invasive, like I have with Japanese knotweed, Go see what's in it and what other plants might need those same nutrients that it's made of. The second thing we're trying to do is also harvest and feed the microorganisms that were living on top of the plant. Much like we had talked about the microorganisms within the soil that help make nutrients soluble for plants, microorganisms exist on the plant's leaves and branches that have beneficial effects with the plant. The same way we have thousands of bacteria on our skin that help keep us healthy. We're essentially growing them and then storing them in light fermentation at the right ratio so that when we use it later on, they are dispersed in the right ratio. Okay, so there isn't any particular plant that's especially good for all of this. Yes and no, as you love to hear. Like dandelion is considered a really good broad spectrum food for plants. And honestly, I think plants are kind of like animals. We're mostly made up of the same stuff. And while the practice can be incredibly helpful, choosing between, say, dandelion and, like, ragweed isn't really going to cause significant difference in plant growth quality, all other things being equal. That doesn't mean you can't be thoughtful about what you choose. If you have tomato plants and you want to treat your tomato plant to a fermented plant juice, use tomatoes. You're going to get exactly what they need for nutrition. You're just feeding it back to them as a soluble food. But if you don't, What do you have around you that's invasive or something that's annoying that you want to get rid of anyway? That way you're not using up plants that you already want to keep. You can use all the stuff you don't want to make your fermented plant juice. Now, with that said, with this practice, it's important to remember that you do need to store it in a refrigerator. And it can be good for about six months, if not more. And like most other KNF ingredients, the ratio you'll hear is one to a thousand or around one teaspoon per gallon. And hopefully this is all making like a lot of sense. Like you're taking the nutrients out of a plant and then feeding it back to a different plant. And it should seem pretty logical once you start thinking about it. Now, what do we do with all these leftovers? You could throw them in your compost or you can make vinegar. And it's a really simple, albeit slow process. If we look at the leftovers, we want to add two parts water to one part of leftovers, cover it again, put it in a dark, cool area and leave it alone for like three months. And I mean like dark, like a basement that doesn't have a window. Yeah, so it sounds like Pruno, a.k.a. prison wine. And that's just not any normal basement hooch I had in mind. Nah, dude. I got this like really sweet banana vinegar that I made. And like the mother, so if you're not familiar with vinegars, they have, naturally they would have what's called a mother. And it's a symbiosis of bacteria and yeast. And it usually is like this round disc that you'll see in the bottom of a vinegar. But for some reason, my banana vinegar has like, it looks like a stack of pancakes. There's like six of them in there. It's awesome. You want to try it? Uh, Like always, no. No. Are are you sure? Yes, I prefer plums or cherries makes the best pruno, or at least that's what I've heard some somewhere. So lucky for you, I'm making something similar. I'm actually making a apple fermented plant juice right now, and I'm going to be making an apple vinegar out of it. So it's not going to be an apple cider vinegar. It's going to be an apple vinegar. I'll definitely hook you up. 
Yeah. And I'm definitely dumb enough to not know the difference between an apple cider vinegar and an apple vinegar. So I'm just going to let that one hang there yet again. We're going to do some cool shit with it. So this is just one way that you could make vinegar. Fruit generally works better than a lot of other stuff. And you can cook with it too. And it's pretty cool to just whip out some homemade vinegar to start putting together something to eat. And another option is also to make malt vinegar. So for you British folks, sorry, my British accent is terrible. I'm sorry, Matt. I hope you can forgive me. I hope he doesn't. I hope he doesn't too. (laughs) So if you have homebrew and it goes bad and it turns to vinegar, there you go. You've got malt vinegar. Congratulations. It's full of lots of good stuff and you can put it on your quote unquote chips as they call it in, in the land of the English. So you've got this stuff in your basement and you've sped up the going bad process, right? And then you harvest whatever you need from it. And then when that's done, you just wait for the rest of it to just go bad again. And then you eat it. Nothing goes to waste in nature. It's always food for something else. Hell yeah. Because that's pretty much what you just said, right? In a way, we're taking scraps from plants to make fermented plant juice. And then the scraps from that process can create a vinegar, which can either be used more in KNF or it can be used to cook with or it can be used as a cleaning agent. So there's like a ton of stuff you can do with vinegar. You can't really have too much vinegar. That's literally what I just said. Stuff goes bad. I think we're already at 40 minutes and there's no way we're going to cover everything I wanted to. But that's okay because this is just an intro to KNF and there's a ton of resources that dive into a lot of this stuff significantly deeper. So hopefully you're finding it interesting. But we still have one thing to cover before uh, we're all done here, and that's IMOs. And why did I save IMOs for last? So, all right, what's an IMO? And I know it's not your opinion, JK, LOL. (sighs) Yeah, you got it. It's an acronym the kids are using these days. In my orifice. No, that's a terrible one. Yep. ever say that again. Yep. (laughs) Keep it in. Keep it Uh, in, Dom. I'm going to get sued. Uh, You're going to have to try that one again. What's that? You're going to have to try that one again. It's funny when you act like you know what kids are into. I think that's funny. IMO, in my office. Come on. Every kid's got an office. It's what, it's what kids do. Yep. Yep. IMO actually stands for indigenous microorganisms, and we harvest and propagate them in five steps, each according to the number that follows it. And what exactly are indigenous microorganisms? Well, there are bacteria and fungi and protozoa and all the other biology that lives within a soil and is really native to a very specific place. So if you're looking to harvest IMOs, you don't really want to harvest like a recently cleared subdivision or like a parking lot or something like that. Someplace maybe with invasive species. The, the goal really is around harvesting the microbiology in a specific place that's mostly been untouched and I use the words untouched pretty loosely in terms of you're trying to get something from someplace that has allowed itself to come back into balance because at, at the end of the day, there's really no place that hasn't been touched by people. So, for example, if you have an apple tree and you want to harvest IMOs to help your apple tree, go find like the oldest apple orchard near you and preferably one that doesn't spray pesticides or maybe it's been abandoned. And if you can, maybe even find like wild apple trees. The idea is you can go to these places, harvest the indigenous microorganisms that have that relationship with the species that you're trying to harvest and taking advantage of the efficiencies because of how those have co-evolved together. So the idea is that with these collections, we can essentially harvest the biology, store it, grow it on a small scale, and then apply it on a large scale. And why would we want to do that? Well, we've talked about the benefits of mimicking local biomes because those species have those evolutions together and in that process become more complex and efficient. The biology in the soil, we've hinted at it, is, you know, it it evolves much more quickly than like people. So if it evolves more quickly, that means it's also become incredibly efficient at converting the exact nutrients into soluble form for those species that they have those relationships with. So we want to harvest those and build those relationships, which will make our trees and the other plants around us that are from those same ecosystems more resilient. Yeah. So for everyone who asked how to grow a tomato, that's how it's done. Yeah. This is our last episode. See you guys.
that all makes sense in theory, I guess, but let's talk more science facts of IMOs or whatever they're called, indigenous microorganisms. Yeah, and one thing I'll note is if this is like, I mean, I think it makes a lot of logical sense, but if you want like documented evidence, we're actually including in the show notes uh, a bunch of studies that have looked at all the things we've been talking about in this episode and providing evidence that this stuff actually works. And to me, that's really important. So if you're interested, go check it out. Now, in terms of IMO, it's a really simple process, actually, but it does take a little bit of practice. So remember that rice wash we did to collect LAB? And make cheese. The rice that you didn't throw away because you're a responsible adult, that can be used for collecting IMO1. Now, there's a lot of debate about the right way to cook the rice for harvesting IMOs, but I'll be honest, and I've tried a couple of the different ways, and it's never been consistent and working. And I've collected at least a couple dozen of these at this point. So cook your rice, put it in a breathable container. Typically, it's like a wicker or a mesh or wood or whatever. Again, KNF has these very specific guidelines on what this process should look like. And I've actually had more luck ignoring the process completely and using like a plastic bin. And that's like the worst idea possible if you were to ask anyone. So figure out what works for you. And what we're going to do is get that rice in close contact with the microbial community where you want to harvest. So if you want, say again, an apple orchard IMO, because you're trying to grow some heirloom apples or something like that, take your rice, scrape some of the leaf litter away from where you're going to put the rice container. And if you move some leaves, throw them back on top. So like your bin that you're using should be like slightly buried into like the soil hummus. And then the leaves that were there and all the stuff, you should start like kind of scraping around it and almost over the top. Over the top, there should be something to protect it, a paper towel or mesh or whatever. And if it's someplace that you're worried about like wild animals, squirrels, you name it, you can like just put like any kind of like chicken wire or something like that over it to keep them out for a few days. The spot should ideally be out of direct sunlight and again, should be pretty accessible for those microbes. It's really important to find that leaf litter to make sure that it's some, or you know, active grass or whatever it might be to be sure that it's going to get in access with the things that you want. So you're going to leave it out, preferably when it's not raining, for 2 to 10 days, and that really depends on the weather. So if it's really hot, it'll be closer to 2. If it's like near freezing, it'll be closer to 10. For most folks, that means like 4 or so days. And when harvesting, you'll know you've got a good harvest because it'll be like this white cloud-looking puff. And while some coloring is acceptable, cons black and red are considered bad, the thing is, our scientific understanding of this process to this point doesn't really provide any evidence for any of this being based in science in terms of like what's good and bad. We do have documentation that IMOs work and are effective, but I haven't seen anything about like identifying specifically which ones you don't want to have. And as much as we like to pretend that we have like a full understanding or even like an almost full understanding about any of this stuff, we're still really at kind of like the bloodletting with leeches stage of understanding of what's going on in our soil. Yeah, I'm pretty sure my doctor says bloodletting with leeches still works. You might want to see a new doctor. Also for also for the record, this is not a cheese. Also not a cheese. This this rice one outside for a couple of days. We're, it's, we're just going to repeatedly- It's not a cheese. No, just because we referenced the first one as like a cheese. I don't want people thinking this is like a food episode, you know? <laughs> for the record, Elliot is going to name everything that is not a cheese. Just so you know. Microphones, not a cheese. No, no. If we're mold, not a cheese. Well, mold can be a cheese, I guess. That's so. what I'm saying. A lot of Plot mold twist. can be cheese, but I'm just saying these specific molds, not cheeses. No, definitely not. So let's go with assuming you did get your big white fluffy cloud. You're gonna want to quickly make it from IMO one to IMO two. Which congratulations, you've collected IMO one. You're one fifth of the way there. You've got your puffy little white fungi on rice, and you're going to harvest that rice that's been inoculated. So you're going to harvest all the stuff that you've got there, and you're going to stuff it into a jar with brown sugar, equal parts by weight. So again, this should sound kind of familiar. You're going to mix it up really good, make sure it's fully covered, and that brown rice is going to go through that osmotic pressure to pull out all the water from those micro bodies by absorbing the water molecules through that, again, osmotic pressure. The microbes sporulate, which means they produce spores, and become dormant through this loss of water. This drying process is called IMO2, so congratulations, you're already two steps in. 
And that process takes about a week and causes the spores to be shelf stable for at least two years in the refrigerator. So now you've got what you need. You've got the the good stuff. Okay, so that's IMO 1 and 2. IMO 1, you make your little rice puff and you put it outside. And then after it's done in a couple days, you bring it back in. And then you pack that rice puff into, you mix it up with the brown sugar, right? And then you pack it up for storage for about a week or so. Yeah. And that's it. That's IMO 1 and 2. Easy peasy mushroom squeezy. No, you don't squeeze them. You let them naturally drip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. The death juice. Yeah, you don't want to squeeze it. No squeezing. Not a cheese. It's like coffin liquor of plants. Mmm. So at this point, we've harvested and stored the IMO. The next steps are centered around the process of propagating it and then using it on our site. And this is where it can get expensive, but there are some ways around that. They might not be fully KNF approved, but I've had good success with it. The next steps involve a few other resources, which is why I covered a lot of the other practices like harvesting FPJs and so on. First is the incorporation of rice hulls, and like a lot, because basically what you're trying to do is provide a foundation for your IMO to grow. Fundamentally, the benefit of rice hulls is that they've traditionally been cheap if you're in South Korea, and they help balance equal parts carbohydrates and carbon. The balance allows the IMO to grow without growing too quickly and causing the pile that's becoming inoculated from getting too hot, quite literally, and, well, cooking them. You can make this process as simple or as complicated as you want. If you don't have access to rice hulls like me, there are a lot of ways to get around this challenge. People have had success with things like wheat mill run, rolled oats, and wood chips, and the key is to make sure that they're equally balanced with carbs and carbon. I personally like to keep it a little bit diverse, both physically in terms of the size of what I'm using, as well as in the material. So like if I want to use wood chips or pine shavings, you can get them in bigger or smaller sizes. The carbohydrate is usually the bigger challenge. Folks will use oats as a cheaper, more commonly found option here in the US. It's typically available at places like Tractor Supply. And if you're thinking about using local ingredients because you want to be prepared for the apocalypse, Something like acorn meal is something you could really harvest yourself and would be widely available across most of North America. The point is to get around that 50% carbon and 50% carbohydrate range, and it doesn't have to be perfect. If you're following the book, you would use 60 pounds of rice bran, 5 teaspoons of OHN, which we haven't covered but is honestly not super crucial and is mostly to keep pests away, and 5 teaspoons of fermented plant juice from dropwort, 10 teaspoons of brown rice vinegar, 5 teaspoons of rock mineral A, which is usually substituted with azomite. That's, again, a little bit of a longer conversation I don't want to get into. 4 tablespoons of IMO2 and 5 gallons of pond water, or rainwater if pond water isn't available. The various smaller teaspoons are added into that pond water or rainwater when applied. So you got your 5 gallons of water, put a couple teaspoons in. You know, you don't have to use drop wort, you can use whatever you've got. If you don't have brown rice vinegar, use your fruit vinegar that you made. If you don't have rock mineral A, you can get like azomite pretty cheap online or just don't add it. So you can mix all these liquids together, spray the material that you're using, whether it's oats or what have you. Mix them all up, add your IMO, make sure it's all mixed thoroughly. You want it liquidy but not soaking. So like if you've ever stuck your hand in really nice soil and it's like almost clumpy but not fully clumpy that's what you're looking for where you make it is primarily someplace that's not in direct sunlight and protected from rain traditionally people will find like a shady spot that's directly on the ground and then they'll cover it with a tarp and uh ultimately what you need to do now is watch for the temperature now i've never seen anyone who makes it to a t so if you're interested and you start reading about it and feel overwhelmed and you're like well i just want to make it the right way don't worry about it Every KNF expert that teaches classes has their own take on it, including Master Cho, who literally wrote the book on it. The general idea is inoculating primarily with what you've harvested in the IMO and then supplementing with the fermented plant products which host nutrients and other IMOs from the plants that they were taken from. Most folks will make piles that are mixes of multiple IMOs. So if you're making topsoil for your garden and you primarily plant tomatoes and cucumbers, you might want to have a tomato FPJ, 
or a tomato FFJ and a cucumber FFJ or FPJ, whatever you're really looking to do. Further, you can do the same thing if you're trying to make soil for your apple hickory forest. Mix those two things together. Yeah, so you got pretty long-winded there. Great explanation, Andy. I appreciate it. That's what I do. You know what they call me, uh, long-winded Andy. Yeah, you're a windbreak. I'm trying to think, how much would this like cost to just make like a, a batch? It sounds like you're making a little bit or... I don't know. Are you making just a little bit or a lot? Yeah. So traditionally, you like in this, what we're talking about, if you're trying to make like a, you can use like a 50 pound bag of rolled oats, which is like 16 bucks. So you can do that. And then add the rolled oats, some wood chips or pine shavings from like tractor supply. Between those two things, you might run around $40 and the final mix would be around a hundred pounds. I'd also sometimes add some diluted seawater or seawater itself, uh, which like just like a cup or two of seawater into the mix which adds some of those trace minerals into the soil, which is also really good. The fundamental thing I think that gets lost sometimes when we start learning these new processes is that we're supposed to be using local ingredients and trying to mix these things together. If we're trying to do it locally, that means doing it locally, not from local other parts of the world, what they thought was local, and then just saying, well, that's what they use, so I have to use those same exact things. That kind of misses the point. Once we get all this stuff mixed up, like I said, you're going to cover it. And this pile is going to heat up because you've essentially just made a buffet for the microbacteria that was in your IMO. Now, if you have a compost thermometer, you're going to need it to make sure the stuff on the inside doesn't get cooked. You're going to want to turn the pile over every two days or so, and this might take a few weeks. But you'll know when it's done when the pile is completely covered in white mycelium that spreads across the entire pile and ends up creating these like clumps. They almost look like rocks. But they're just like when you see a pile of topsoil and there's like those rock balls that like roll out of it and you just can like squeeze them and break them up because they're just dirt. It's like that, except they're covered in white and the pile will start to cool down because it's no longer processing anymore. So what you've done is essentially create a giant pile of the collection you harvested with some added benefits. And the next step is getting that ready for your garden. And that's called IMO4. Yeah. So we're just growing fungi with this fun guy. <laughs> oh, still not a cheese. Still not a cheese. IMO is actually pretty simple. All you need to do is break up those chunks I just described a second ago, mix with equal parts soil from your site, or if you're bringing stuff in, you can do that too. Some folks will add biochar at this stage. Again, you'll go through the same compost heating process that you did because it's going to, again, try to work its way into that soil and you'll have to turn it every few days until it starts to cool down again like imo3 there's a lot of debate about what ingredients should be used at this stage okay so if i'm understanding this imo3 and 4 are different because let's see imo3 you're taking what you made in imo2 and just proliferating it like making making more of it right and then imo4 you're taking it and getting ready and introducing it into like a more natural type of soil so that you can get ready to like spread it out and have it do its thing. Cause you can't just take the clumps of it and just throw it out, you know, in your garden or in your pasture or whatever you're trying to do with it, right? Exactly. You're inoculating a big sample essentially and then mixing that with the natural stuff in the area so that it can find its own balance and not get overwhelmed and kind of just beaten down by what's the native biology for where your trees are today or your garden or whatever it might be. Now, IMO5 is an optional step that you can take. The basic idea of IMO5 is to add something that's like heavily nitrogen to your IMO4. That's typically like if you have livestock and you have all their waste and you want to work it into your compost or topsoil, it's something you can do in that as a next step. And much like when you made IMO3 or 4, you're going to want to, again, add some of those FPJs, FFJs, seawater, whatever it might be to help balance it out. And again, you'll probably have to turn it over like a compost again. So just be aware of some of the challenges that come with it and different ways that you can make a topsoil that's not only full of good nutrition, but also the indigenous microorganisms that will really help your plants succeed. Yeah. So IMO5 is to just literally add some shit. Yeah. Keeping shit real. Keeping it real real by adding shit. Quite literally. And that's probably where this shit show should stop. We've dumped a whole lot of dense content on you, and we really just covered the basics of KNF. We didn't touch on OHN and a number of other processes, fermented seawater, 
and so on. But hopefully now you have like the, the real important stuff figured out and it doesn't feel super overwhelming if you start reading in all of the acronyms and all of the things that make it sound super scary. So now you've got kind of that basic framework. Yeah, I'm looking forward to mixing shit and making vinegar in my kitchen. Maybe trying this cheese out. I'll have to convince the old wife, though. She's down. She's down for that cheese, that curd. Yeah, if there's one thing my wife loves more than me, it's mold. Hell yeah. Yeah, she likes her mold like she likes her men. Black, it grows on you, and deadly over time. It's amazing you ever got married. Yeah, I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. Absolutely weird. Yeah, and uh, maybe next episode we'll talk to Elliot about learning rock farming. It was rock tossing, I believe. Rock tossing. Pavlovian rock tossing. Ah, so is it like the rocks ring a bell and then you throw them? Or like, how does that work? No, I think it's when you just stone somebody you don't like to death. And you forget about it when someone rings a bell? So it never happened? Doesn't count? Yeah, as long as everybody else does it, it's not really just your fault, right? The American way. (laughs) No, it's not actually. Thank you guys for listening. This is Andy, and this is... What are we, Elliot? We are an almanac. Of the Poor Pros. Yep, this is the Poor Pros podcast. Poor Pros Almanac. Thanks, guys. (laughs) 